All right, church family, our call to worship this morning from Psalm 66, verses 1 through 5. This is God's word for us this morning. Psalm 66, verses 1 through 5. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. Father, we come this morning. And we've received that invitation to just stand before you and each other in this place. This, your lordship is written, Father, all over this text. You are Lord over all the earth, over all man. And when there is mountains on our left and on our right and the enemy behind us and a Red Sea in front of us, Father, we believe that you are able to make a way for your people. So if my life this morning speaks of anxiety, if my life this morning speaks of difficulties I can't foresee and I can't see my way forward, if my life this this, this morning speaks brokenness, we come before you, Lord, and ask for your mighty hand to move on our behalf that you would come and visit us this morning we stand in awe of your great and wonderful deeds in Jesus name amen I want to encourage you to prayer this morning with a passage from Hebrews uh, chapter 12 I'm not going to have it on the screen I just decided to do this while we were singing so <clears throat> Hebrews 12, verse 18 says, You have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What this verse tells us is that you and I, as we come together, we do not come Uh, to some reality that we can touch with our hands or see with our eyes. Rather, as the church, we gather together in faith in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when we do that, our worship joins up with the worship that is occurring in heaven right now as the angels are gathered festally, as they're gathered with saints that have gone before us. And on Sunday morning, when all of the people of God are gathered, their worship joins up with the worship that's occurring in heaven. And in that sense, we come. We come to Mount Zion. We come to the city of the living God. And what that means for you this morning is that as we do something like sit and pray, something cosmic is happening, something profound and life-altering. And when the saints gather and they pray and they worship, people get healed and they hear the gospel and they leave their sins and they find themselves letting go of things like bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and they forgive and they love. These things we may not be able to see or measure with our eyes, but they happen because heaven meets earth every Sunday morning. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we come to you this morning asking to be for us what we cannot be for ourselves, to uh, slay our pride, and to draw us into the worship that's already occurring in heaven. 
God, as we enter June, what some consider Pride Month, uh, we pray that we would have none of that marked in, in ourselves or in our own hearts, a pride that would exalt ourselves and our standards above the Lord Jesus and above his word. But God, in a month that it, uh, where, where we are going to be uh, bombarded and assaulted by the cultural norm for morality, uh, we, we pray for your spirit to be heavy uh, on us and our, our path. We pray for our friends. We pray for our family that are even, even now perhaps in the grip of sexual sin. We pray for those who, who may be strongly tempted in that area of life and they want to follow you, they want to obey you, but with the pressures of the world and the pressures of their own flesh, that they don't know how they can. We pray that this month, this season would be marked by great deliverance and that you'd give your people on earth a sweet spiritual gift for pointing people to the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. There is no lack of testimony in the world from folks that have been forever set free from desires and shackles that they thought they'd have to live with forever. God, we acknowledge your patience. We proclaim your patience. We praise you for your patience that you are holding back your judgment and your justice seeking those who would find you and love you and trust you with their whole hearts but God we ask that you would be gracious and merciful to our nation gracious and merciful to our culture that we would turn our hearts back to you in, in repentance and faith and we confess our own pride God long before there was pride month there were men calling themselves Christians, completely laying down their responsibility to lead their families and point them to Jesus. So God, we pray that revival starts in our own hearts, and spills out into our churches, spills out into our homes, our towns, our states, our nation, and the world. And that you would be seen as precious and worthy. God, as we think about the world, we think about Scott and Brenda Zior who minister uh, on, our, on, our, um, on our list of missionaries that we support. Think of Scott in New Delhi right now, training and, and working with and encouraging church planters and local pastors. God, we pray for the ordinary kind of comforts they need to minister, like water, uh, a break from the heat, temperatures well over... 100 degrees right now we pray that you would provide for them every ordinary means of comfort so that they can be about the work of the gospel there in India and that you'd protect them also from every force that would come against them and try to get in the way of their work God we give you now our hearts as we give as we continue to sing as we sit under your word asking once again Remove our pride and give us the only kind of joy and peace that is worth having. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles this morning, you're welcome to, and I would encourage you to, open them to the Gospel of John, chapter 16. We're going to start right where we left off last week in verse 4. Remembering that Jesus has just been talking about persecution, expecting uh, that his disciples should expect uh, to be treated the way he was treated. The uh, conversation shifts, the theme shifts, uh, and verse 4 is, is the hinge of that, of that shift. So starting in verse 4, the Lord says, I have said these things to you, 
that when their hour comes, you may, may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now, I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. These are the words of the Lord, and they are for us today. Let's pray. Father and God, we commit to you our hearts in this time. We ask that you would speak uh, in this to each of our hearts. Uh, that our hearts would be fashioned after the image of your Son, that we would see Jesus as supremely uh, worthy and beautiful and uh, our our treasure, that we would know him better for these things, follow him more earnestly, and we would have the peace and the joy that he describes uh, in the rest of the chapter. God, I pray for my lips to be faithful and for all of our ears and hearts to be open. In Jesus' name, amen. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Uh, John Lennon's famous song, Imagine, uh, goes on from there to suppose that if there were no God in heaven, no religion, no possessions, no nations or countries, then the world would actually have peace. As if there's not something fundamentally wrong with people that actually explains why all these things go wrong. Lenin fails to consider that maybe Heaven's not the problem, hell's not the problem, religion's not the problem, possessions aren't the problem, nations and countries aren't the problem. Maybe something is wrong deeply with people. What Lenin, I think, also fails to consider is that above us only sky would ultimately have to mean no justice, no objective moral lawgiver and judge who can rightly and finally enforce justice. What above us only sky would mean was that the, the, there was no objective standard outside of ourselves. And Lenin actually fails to see that no standard outside ourselves is actually the reason for all the chaos and tribulation in the world. The one thing that Lenin does get right in his song is that peace on earth won't actually come from one country. He's right about that. It won't come from a source that we can materially possess. And in a sense, peace won't even come through religion. It comes, rather, from a person. Jesus says in verse 33 of our passage this morning, that I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He says virtually the same thing to the disciples back in chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Do I give to you. 
the unique promise of Christianity, the unique promise for those in Jesus Christ is that you can have peace and joy in a troubled, troubled world. It can't be given, this peace, by the world. This peace and this joy, it can't be taken by the world. It says that Jesus gives it to those in him. That is to say, peace comes by being uniquely and truly and personally connected to Jesus Christ. You might remember that this section of John, hopefully you remember, I say it every week, this section of John is full of Jesus' last words to his disciples before his crucifixion. They've been told that soon they're going to part ways. And Jesus teaches them here in order to soothe their fears and anxieties and sorrows about that parting and to prepare them for their mission in the world. And here, in our passage today, he once again assures his disciples of the peace that he's going to leave with them, even in a world of great, great trouble. So the main emphasis, the main point of this passage this morning, I think, is that you and I, as disciples of Jesus, can have peace and we can have joy in a very troubled world, a sinful, broken world. And I want to point out three reasons why, three ways the text shows us why we can have peace and joy in a troubled world. Number one comes from the verses we just read, verses 4 through 15, and it is that we do not live for God in this world by our own power. We do not live for God by our own power. So one reason we can have joy, we can have peace in this troubled world is that we don't live in it on our own steam. Now remember again the source of the disciples' discomfort and sorrow here. They wanted to live in the world for God, for the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. They wanted to see the world come to recognize what they had come to recognize about the worth and weight and beauty of Jesus. But then Jesus was leaving, and this perplexed them and alarmed them and grieved them. How could they do that? How could they live in this world without him? It's important to see that this was the nature of their anxiety because Jesus is promising a very particular kind of peace here to have a very particular kind of anxiety. He's not necessarily offering to give the disciples the kind of peace that comes from just getting what they want. Like, right, like you might have anxiety about an income level that you want to meet. You might have anxiety about a kind of relationship that you want to be in with another person. Or you might have anxiety about some other external thing, and you think Jesus might be a means to that end. Like a celestial slot machine, right? Keep putting that prayer in the right slot and pull the handle and wait for it to all come up sevens. If it's that kind of peace you want, then Jesus is not what you're looking for. And he's not promising that kind of peace. He's actually promising a peace that goes down to the core of what all of our real anxieties and troubles are about. The kind of deep-seated unrest that humanity has, the kind that goes right down to the deepest core of who we are is an anxiety over whether or not God is God and will be known and seen and loved and enjoyed for who he is. Ultimately, that's the kind of peace that Jesus gives. He assures his people that God is God and that he will be seen and he will be known, and he will be loved, and he will be worshipped by the throngs for the Savior and God that he is. That's where the disciples are troubled, and so that's the peace that Jesus speaks about as he seeks to soothe their anxieties. He points out in verses 5 through 6 that the disciples were so sorrowful they even stopped asking Jesus about his departure. 
you remember when he first started talking about it, they had all kinds of questions about him leaving. They were very confused, but now it says that sorrow has so gripped them that they have given up asking questions about it. And it is to that sorrow Jesus speaks when he shares with them this promise about the Holy Spirit. In verse 7, the Holy Spirit is called the helper because he meets the disciples in this need. This fear that they won't be able to live with him and minister in his name in the world. The fear of how can we take this radical message of Jesus' lordship over heaven and earth without him on the earth. That fear is answered by the promise of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will be with them, that he will be in them. Understand here, too, that Jesus doesn't come up with this promise because his disciples are worried. This promise actually goes back generations before even these guys could even worry about this sort of thing. This is an old, old promise. Jesus isn't making it here. He's, he's sharing it. He's reiterating it. Multiple passages in the Old Testament promise an entirely new aeon, an entirely new era in human history that would be marked by the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. In the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2, the Lord promised an unparalleled outpouring of his Holy Spirit. And this was an outpouring that the apostles actually saw fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. In the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, <clears throat> the Lord proclaims, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Now, of course, if we read the Bible carefully, we can see that the Holy Spirit was, he was around all the time in the, in the Old Testament. He's not a new character on the scene of biblical history. He's all over the Bible. He's all over the Old Testament. It was by the Holy Spirit that the prophets prophesied. It was by the Holy Spirit that Daniel interpreted dreams. It was by the Holy Spirit that the judges of Israel liberated their tribes. It was by the Holy Spirit that Joshua led the people of Israel. But what seems to shift here in the new era, what seems to shift here since the coming of Jesus is the degree or scope to which the Holy Spirit's influence is poured out. After the coming of Jesus, it seems that what changed was that more of the Spirit's power was felt and experienced by way more people. And the explanation for this change in history seems to be the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, you might read verse 7, for example, and think, okay, how does that metaphysically work? Like, why, right, why can't the Spirit come until Jesus leaves? Like, can they not be in the same place at the same time? Like, is this like um, tag team wrestling? Like, what is, what is, why is this, what's the deal? But, but I don't think Jesus is saying that the two can't be in the place at the same, same place at the same time. I don't think it's saying that Jesus is somehow like, you know, I have to leave, and then he'll come. Like, I don't, I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at at all. Remember, for example, what Jesus means when he says, I'm going away. What is he talking about when he says, I have to leave? Well, what he's talking about is actually leaving for the cross and coming out of the tomb and ascending to his father, and ruling at his father's right hand, and from his father's right hand, drawing the nations to himself from his father's throne. That's what Jesus means by going away. He's not making a statement about his physical absence being the necessary condition of the Spirit's coming. He's saying, Spirit can't come until I go to the cross, until I come out of the tomb until I send to my Father's right hand and take my place as the rightful ruler and king of all of heaven and earth, and then as the king of all heaven and earth who has the keys of death and Hades in my hands, then I'll send the Spirit. Then he'll have something to work with. I think that's the sense of the passage. 
the Spirit has come in greater fullness because Jesus has accomplished a mission that actually gives the Spirit something to work with. And that's the era, that's the age in which you and I are now living. Just consider your own experience in coming to the Lord for a moment. Can you really explain your coming to the Lord apart from the work of God's Spirit? When you really encounter the Lord Jesus in a changing way, what happened? I can tell you at least three things that happened. One thing is that your definition of sin probably changed. At the very least, your feelings about sin changed. As he says in verse 8, you probably started to understand that feeling of conviction or confrontation or exposure when you sinned and you knew something needed to change. And what needed to change wasn't just a behavior. What needed to change wasn't just a habit. What needed to change wasn't just a frame of mind. You realized that your decisions, your thoughts, your desires, and your words had been rooted in the fact that you were alienated in unbelief from the Lord Jesus, that you needed to place your trust in the Lord Jesus. And when you did that, you started to feel differently about your sin. Another thing that probably happened was that your source of righteousness changed. In other words, before the Holy Spirit started convicting you, you tried to feel right with the world by putting other people down. Or you tried to feel right with God by being the best at your job. Or you tried to feel right by having a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Or you tried to feel right by being the best rule follower you could be, or by looking physically attractive, or by being the smartest person in the room, or by raising compliant children, or some other superficial source of rightness. And then the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to the fact that Jesus Christ is actually God's standard for holiness, that Jesus Christ is actually God's standard for righteousness, And even though you couldn't see Jesus with your physical eyes, the Spirit was working on the eyes of your heart to see Jesus in the Word and to see Jesus in the church. And you knew that your own righteousness was like a dirty rag compared to Jesus. And you knew you needed Jesus. And the other thing that would have happened when the Spirit started convicting you and, and ruling over you was that you realized that God's judgment was best. No longer was your judgment, your wisdom, your discernment best. Rather, you realized it was under, your judgment had been under the influence of a defeated foe. Satan, the accuser. And in Christ, you saw a new wisdom, a new judgment. You saw that God was wise when he said, the first shall be last. That you can be strong in weakness. That salvation is found not by keeping your life, but by losing it. You realized God would be right to judge you, but praise him, praise him, praise him, because his judgment fell on his own son. This is what the Spirit does to everybody who is drawn to the Lord. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in every heart that turns to Christ. And this Holy Spirit is not doing this in a few random hearts in a couple little scraps and corners of the world. He is doing it to multitudes all over the world. That's the new era that you and I live in. And so here's my application from this for you. Here's my application for all of us. Don't long for a better time to minister in. Don't long for a better time to be a Christian in. Some of us are really inflated with a a highly inaccurate view of self, right? That if we had lived during Jesus' time, we'd be way better Christians. Why do you think that? Why don't you think you would have been in the crowds mocking him? Proving of his crucifixion. Don't long for a different time or a better time to be about the work of the Lord's kingdom. Jesus has chosen this one for you. 
Remember the, dis- the, the, the mistake that the disciples kept making. They wanted everything to stay the same. Why are you going away, Jesus? Do you have to go away? Can't you stay? But Jesus says, stop it. You don't get it. This is for your good. This is to your advantage. This is an advantage to you and to the mission I'm going to send you on. Jesus going to the cross, rising from the dead, and ascending into heaven, ushered in an entirely new age in human history. And Jesus tells them it's better to live in that age. Heaven is open. Forgiveness of sins is assured. Jesus is reigning and by his spirit, through his gospel, is drawing the nations to himself. Whatever decade or season or year you are in, it is the year of our Lord, right? 2024 A.D., Anno Domini, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. That's why we call it that. That's why the secular world wants to switch to C.E., by the way, because Anno Domini means in the year of our Lord, We called it the year of our Lord because this is the Lord's time. This is the age of the Lord Jesus. It's a pretty great time to be in this world. So here's the deal. Of course, you can plan for the future. You can plan for the future. That's okay. But you don't live in it. And you you, you can be thankful for the past, but you're not meant to idealize it. You can't go on living as if God's goodness would be just a little bit sweeter if he gave you a time machine. God has chosen you for this age, for this century, for this year, for this day, and so minister in it now. Be grateful now. Be on the mission now. Jesus has put away your sin and connected you to himself, and you have the advantage of God's spirit as you serve him and proclaim him to a lost and dying world. That's the first reason we can have joy and peace in a troubled world. The next is that resurrection is at the center of this world's story. We can have peace and joy in a troubled world because resurrection is at the center of this world's story. Let's jump into verse 16. A little while and you will see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us a little while and you will not see me? And again a little while and you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father. So they were asking, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you'll not see me and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow, because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish, for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. I said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. Because you've loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father. I've come into the world. And now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. So, again, resurrection is at the center of this world's story. And therefore, we can have peace and joy. And I'm getting this point from these references in this section to Jesus saying, a little while. Right? In a little while, you won't see me, but then another little while, and you will see me. Those are most likely references to Jesus' resurrection, his death and resurrection. I think that resurrection best fits the kind of joy that Jesus talks about in verses 20 through 22. In this 
analogy he gives of the, the woman welcoming her, her child into the world. The disciples were about to have unparalleled joy. And it was going to be because Jesus, who had been taken from them so suddenly, had been raised. So Jesus is talking about his resurrection as a source of peace and especially joy here in this section. Consider with me what he says about this resurrection joy. He says at the end of verse 22 that no one will be able to take this from them. Why? Why can no one actually take a Christian's joy from them? Is it because the Christian life is like always like the mountaintop? Like it's always like the peak of the mountain? Certainly not. We all know that from experience alone. Rather, no one should be able to run off with a Christian's joy because that joy is personified at God's own right hand in heaven right now. Jesus raised means Jesus ruling, which means Jesus returning, which means heaven coming, which means the dead being raised, which means every tear being wiped away. And no one can touch that joy because that joy is safely resurrected, ruling in heaven at his Father's right hand unassailable. And if that's where you plant your joy, then your joy will be unassailable also. I think Jesus hints at this also in verse 23 when he says that in the day of Jesus' resurrection, the disciples will ask nothing of him. They will ask nothing of him. And what I, what I think this means is that all the questions that the disciples might have had about Jesus going away, Jesus Jesus coming to do what he did the way he did it, all the questions they might have about who he is and why he did what he did will be settled and answered by the resurrection. Jesus says those kind of questions won't come up anymore because me being raised will have answered them. I think this is also an explanation for the kind of peace and joy the Lord gives. In other words, um, Jesus doesn't give me peace by answering all my questions about the suffering that I and you experience in life. He doesn't give us peace by telling us every detail of our future. But he was raised from the dead. And that settles some questions. It settles the question of what kind of story we're in. You and I do not live in a Shakespearean tragedy. We are living in in a classical comedy. Of course, things that are sad happen. We know shocking things happen. We know tragic things happen. But the ending of the story of human history is triumphant and happy. The ending is a resurrection followed by a wedding. That's how the story ends. And that's the story we're in. And Jesus' resurrection assures us that that's the story we're in. Notice, too, that this joy can't be taken because as we wait for this happy ending, this resurrection, we've been connected to a generous Father, right, who provides us joy and everything else we need in order to keep following Him. Remember how Jesus says, you need not ask me to ask the Father. Rather, you can go straight to the Father. Find it again. In that day, verse 26 You will ask in my name, and I do not say that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you've loved me and have believed that I came from God. Because of Jesus, we have a Father that we are directly connected to again in a way that humanity had not been connected to since the fall. Father who provides us joy Father who provides us everything we need in order to keep following him. A Father that we can come to and ask and expect generous gifts. I think that's what Jesus is basically talking about in 23 and 24. In English, it reads a little funny, right? The, you, know, you read 23, in that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name. Like, what do you, okay, so we are, are we not asking or are we asking? What, you know, what are we, but Jesus is talking about two different kinds of asking. And in the early part, he's talking about asking questions, those kinds of questions that the disciples had, like, 
why are you going, you know, why are you going away? And what is all this about? And surely you're not going to die? And like questions like that, Jesus says, you'll be able to put those away because of the resurrection. But having gone through the cross, having gone through the tomb, having connected to his people, to his father, then there's a different kind of asking we get to experience. And that's the asking the father for what we need in order to live for him. Asking for his good and generous gifts. I, I think maybe this is what James had in mind in James chapter 1. When he talked this way, he said, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Or when he says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. James can have the joy of calling God his Father, who gives good gifts, who gives spiritual gifts like wisdom, who gives spiritual gifts like joy, who gives them generously to his children, and he can do this because Jesus has connected him to this Father by his work on the cross. And so, yeah, I mean, if you could take the Father out of, some, out of a Christian's life, then you could take his joy, but because Jesus has connected us to this Father, our joy cannot ultimately not be stolen. I think these truths, these realities are profound sources of peace and joy for the believer in Christ. So here's the application from this. The application from this is that you should ask the Father for spiritual fruit. You should ask the Father for joy. You should ask the Father for patience. You should ask the Father for love. You should ask the Father for self-control. You should ask in faith then you should be ready to receive it in whatever package he sends it in. I alluded to this a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, during the pastoral prayer time. The idea that if you want wisdom for navigating trials with joy, if that's what you're asking God for in your trial, God, give me wisdom, then you had better be prepared for the fact that he's going to let the trial continue so that he can teach you how to have joy in it, how to have wisdom in it. He tells us to ask for that wisdom in faith because often what God gives is not an immediate break from our trials, but more trials so that we have more lessons for fighting, in fighting for joy in those trials. Maybe you've experienced this. Oftentimes you ask God for things and you're like, oh, he's not giving it. And the reality is he has given it and it's right in front of you. You just don't see it. So, for example, let's just say you want to be more loving. You know you need to be more loving. And so you say, God, help me be more loving. Help me be more loving. Help me, help me. I want to be more loving. And then you open your eyes and you look around. And God has answered that prayer by surrounding you with a lot of people that are easy to love? No. No. That's not how it works. Usually he answers the prayer by sending you a lot of people that are going to give you lots of practice in how to love. And he's right there with you. He's right there with you by his spirit to give you that practice. No variation or shadow due to change, James says. The Father is always generous, always providing, always what is good. And so, ask. If resurrection is at the center of the story, God wants to give his children good things. So just ask. Finally, we can have peace and joy in a troubled world because Jesus' first victory ensures his final one. Because Jesus' first victory at the cross ensures his final one on the last day. Verse 29. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it is come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and you will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. I said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, notice here again this statement, I have 
overcome the world. It's being said in a context where I think the disciples are having another one of their presumptuous moments. They say in verse 29 through 30, Ah, now we understand you. Now we get it. Now it's all clear. We're good. Got it. 10-4. Message received. Message received. But look at how Jesus responds. Well, first of all, remember that Jesus said their questions wouldn't actually be answered until his resurrection. So that's one. Jesus has said, you'll understand later. And they're like, no, 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 we get it now. We're good. But then notice Jesus' response in verse 31. Oh, now? Now you get it? You get it now? Do you? Because in a minute like a minute, you're going to scatter. You're going to run. I see two things being contrasted here. On the one hand, you've got the disciples' weakness. right? Their failure to completely understand, their presumption that they know more than they actually do, or at least that they're braver than they actually are. Their inflated assessment of their own maturity and strength. That's on the one hand. But on the other is Jesus' Jesus' subtle and gentle rebuke that their weakness will not prevent him and his father from using them to accomplish his mission in the world. All right, just again, set it in context. He's just told them, you're weak, you're going to run, and yet take heart. I have overcome the world. I'm still going to keep you. I'm still going to use you. You're still going. I like Marcus Dodds on this passage. He says, quote, It is part of the character and genius of the church that its foundation members were discredited men. The church owed its existence not to their faith, courage, or virtue, but to what Christ had done with them. And this they could never forget. In other words, the real credibility of the Christian faith is grounded not in the fact that there are a lot of really excellent people that make up the church. It's grounded in the fact that Christ has done really excellent things for truly sinful, imperfect people, and we just can't let it go. We can't let it go. We have to tell the news that Jesus is raised, that Jesus is reigning, and that because he accomplished that, he will win the day. To put another way, We get to live in this world with the assurance that Jesus will successfully use an imperfect people for his mission in the world because he successfully used even a cross. He didn't fail then. He won't fail with his church. And so here's the application I would make from this. I'd say don't wait for a spiritual gift before you get about the work of ministry in the world. Don't wait for the spiritual gift you think you need in order to minister in this world. Minister, sure, to find out what that gift might be, but minister first and see what the Lord wants to give. I think we have a whole era of Christians who want to do their Christianity in a classroom. Our faith has been so defined by the classroom that we actually take spiritual gifts tests. We take tests. I really looked forward to being done with school so I could quit taking tests. I really looked forward to getting out of the classroom. And I don't want anybody to have false guilt for having taken a spiritual gifts test. I've taken them before. I I would just point out a couple of things about this, though. One, I would point out, is that the pattern of New Testament ministry is ministry first, gifting second. It's, gift, it's, it's not gifting, then ministry. It's mission, then gifting. The call, the mission, comes first, and the sending comes first, and then the gifting happens. The other thing I would point out is that we don't want to wait around for gifting before we minister and end up unintentionally communicating that we think God will fail if we're just not quite ready enough or gifted enough for ministry in the world. We don't want to sit on our hands waiting for spiritual gifts to fall from the sky while the world gets to look on and say, 
I think they must think their God really isn't mighty enough to get much out of them, the way they're sitting around waiting. So just try this. Serve where you see the need. Take a risk. Sure, you, you might find out that you're not particularly skilled in what you put your hands to. That doesn't mean God won't beautify and gift the ministry. I think a lot of times we think about gifts in the same way that we think about talents or superpowers, right? Like, I've got this gift, right? And, you know, like, I have hospitality the way Superman flies, right? Like, it's got this gift I carry around. And I just, I don't necessarily think the Bible speaks about gifts that way. I think he tends to speak about gifts in the way where you might just be like this bumbling evangelist who never really quite remembers every part of the gospel, but you just go after it anyway, and then God comes along beside you, God comes along behind you, and he polishes it all up, and he gets something out of it. He redeems it, and then it ends up affecting somebody else's life. I think, that's the, I think that's the gift. I think that's how it works. I don't think we strut around with gifts like they're superpowers. I think God just is coming along behind all that we're doing, and he's polishing it up, and he's beautifying it, and he's redeeming it, and he's making it powerful. I think he wants to do that. So we just got to get about it. We got to go do it. We got we to gotta take risks and do things that we might not be good at and ask the Lord, to just be mighty in it. You can try this out. You can try this out really soon. We got Love Our City next month, right? A cooperative effort across Yankton to just do service projects for the love of Jesus. There'll be other projects, not just with our hands, that will give you opportunity to actually have conversations, perhaps, with people that you know don't know the Lord. You'll just be able to bless them and maybe be put in a situation where you can tell them about the love of of Jesus. You could take one of those opportunities. There's going to be lots of them publicized in the coming weeks, and I would encourage you to pick one of those out and take the risk that God will go behind you, go before you, and beautify whatever you put your hands to that day. There are opportunities in the church cleaning the sanctuary on Fridays. We need somebody to clean the sanctuary. The gal that was doing it um, can't do it anymore. She's not able. And so... We need somebody in here on Fridays to make the room ready for you guys on, on Sundays. Be a Ready Now Recovery facilitator. There are great stories of, of recovery and victory and great challenges those facilitators meet week in and, and week out. Do something like that. Help in the sound booth. Be a greeter. Volunteer in the nursery. Especially volunteer in the nursery. I'm not good with kids. Nobody is until they try. Um, there are opportunities in your neighborhood. Invite your neighbor over for a meal or a bonfire, and then when they're, when they're over there, ask them, hey, you know, we've been living next to each other all these years. How can I pray for you? See if maybe that would lead to a conversation about the Lord. But one way or the other, don't wait for a gifting before serving the Lord or his people, or the lost. Go on mission, and he will provide the gift. Let's pray. Oh, Father and God, oh, we, we ask for your hand and your spirit to be upon us in this moment that you'd sow faith in our hearts by this word. Oh, just give us the grace we need for this moment. Help us to have the joy that this passage talks about. Give us this joy. We ask, God, we ask in accordance with your promise. We ask in accordance with your character. Your son tells us to ask. So help us to have this peace. Help us to have this joy that can't be assailed, can't be taken. It's founded and planted in the risen Jesus. And help us know, help us now. Remember and proclaim your son well in his supper. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I want like a powerful amen at the, at the end here, okay? So we're going to do a benediction.
It's a responsive benediction. And then we're going to give like an amen that justifies like a, a whoop, right? Okay, so like, amen. Okay, all right. Let's do it that way. You've been prepared. Today's benediction is from Revelation 5, 12 and 13. I'm going to do the first part, then we'll do the second part together. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. Excellent. Excellent.